today and welcome to all. Um, we are thrilled to have Faces and Voices of Recovery here today, as well as our wonderful partners at For New York. And to tell you a little bit more about For New York, here is Teresa Noor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you to you again. Your enthusiasm over this topic is contagious. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's really wonderful. It's been a great partnership for For New York um, to be working with Healthy Capital District New York, and and you've just been a ray of sunshine. So, thank you for that, Carrie. And um, for those who don't know, Friends of Recovery New York, we are the statewide RCO Recovery Community Organization. So, faces and voices, thank you so much. Our uh, nationwide RCO to be presenting on today's call. And then I also see there are members of our local RCOs out there in, in the audience today. Um, this is a really important topic. I'm really excited to be here and thank you again to our sponsors. I don't see um, Emily or um, I forget who else was going to be here today, but uh, yeah. For, yeah. I but, did send them an email, so I can only imagine that they must be having difficulties um, getting on for, for whatever reason. Okay, well, just, you know, giving appreciation and shout out to mm -hmm. Opioid Response Network because, you know, this series has been really well attended and um, it's really easy to digest, right? We get these little yeah. snippets of an hour, an hour and a half, and but it's pretty comprehensive and it's been building one to the next, so tell your friends about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell your colleagues and uh, put it out there to your networks that there's more to come. So um, Friends of Recovery New York, we have, I, I mean, I'll put some information in the chat about our upcoming trainings, um, the upcoming recovery conference in October, which we have a great lineup this year. It's virtual again, um, but that enables us to have international speakers. We've got Guy Felicella doing some harm reduction stuff, Nikki Myers doing um, Y12 SR, so the yoga of 12 step recovery, and she's going to be talking about the intersection of addiction, race, and trauma, which really uh, interesting keynote uh, that we'll be having at the conference. So, a whole bunch of stuff I won't tell you all about it, but I'll put a link so you, if you're interested, you can come. And if you're into recertifying any of your um, credentials, whether it's SERPA, CARC, um, KSAC, I think we'll even be applying for social work credit for the conference this year and up to 16.75 credits available. So if you're a SERPA, that's over half of what you need to recertify. So come on board. And I, as I said, I'll put all that in the chat and thank you, Carrie. I'll bounce it back to you. Sure. And yeah, I just want to echo your sentiments about the Friends of Recovery Conference. It's just a phenomenal um, conference and going virtual is really like, oh, how is this going to be? Because it's such a great place to connect with people um, in person from all over the state. But the virtual was also equally fantastic. So I encourage all to attend if you haven't before. Um, and now without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Faces and Voices of Recovery. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Teresa. We are absolutely grateful and blessed to be a part of this. Um, and before we dive into the presentation today, we do want to share some great information about the Opioid Response Network. We had dropped the link for the Opioid Response Network in the chat there. Uh, this organization is SAMHSA funded and assists or, uh, organizations and individuals to provide resources and technical assistance to address the issues that are affecting their region. Uh, so this technical assistance and support is available free of charge. You just need to go to the opioidresponsenetwork.org website and click on the submit a request button in the top right hand corner. They are uh, able to match you up with a specialist in your region who will get your request filled out and sent over to a subject matter expert uh, who will be able to assist and support you with your needs. So any more information or uh, if you have questions, you want to submit a technical assistance request to the Opioid Response Network, here's their website, their email. You can call and get a, uh, a kind person to walk you through the process. If you have any questions about that, just feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll get them answered. Oops, sorry, my slideshow wasn't working there for a minute. And uh, we want to engage you and uh, encourage participation in this presentation. So if you have a question, uh, uh, 
one of our presenters here at Faces and Voices who is not currently presenting will engage you with, with you in chat. If you want to raise your hand during a question and answer period, then here's some instructions on how to do that either on your PC or your phone or your tablet. Before we dive in, uh, we do want to touch base on some safety agreements today uh, because we'll be talking about some topics that might bring up, bring up some challenges from our experiences in the past. So please do uh, respect these. These are our values and our non-negotiables. So being open-minded, having respect for others, being encourageable, uh, uh, encouraging folks. And if you say something that you didn't mean or it comes out wrong, then you can say, ouch. Um, also confidentiality. So someone had recently said in one of our, one of our trainings that um, what's learned here share uh, is uh, is leaves here, but what's uh, shared here stays here. So if you learn something, then take it with you and share it. But if you if we're talking about some things that are personal or agency specific, well, let's value our confidentiality and keep that here. If there are any other values or safety agreements uh, you can think of go ahead and unmute or drop that in the chat and we'll add that to our list here. All right, some folks might be typing in chat. So if we see any of those safety agreements, we'll make sure to honor those. And now we'll dive into the presentation. Uh, and I forgot to introduce myself. So my name is Nelson Spence. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'm the Accreditation Services Coordinator here at Faces and Voices of Recovery. That means I'm blessed to work with organizations, RCOs, and Peer Recovery Support Service Programs going through the Council on Accreditation of Peer Recovery Support Services. I'm also a man in recovery. What that means for me is I've overcome my problematic relationship with substances. I began my recovery journey on October 1st of 2018. I was uh, blessed enough to be able to okay, go through. Okay. Uh, and if, if you're unmuted, if you'd please just go ahead and mute yourself, really that would be fantastic. Yeah, I think she forgot it. Hold on one second. I'm going to figure out who it is. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. No problem. And um, after, after treatment, I was able and fortunate enough to live in some recovery housing. Uh, uh, Oxford House was a part of my story. And every step of the way, peers were so impactful in helping me to achieve recovery. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment, but I do want to pass it over to our amazing co-presenter, Chrissy. Thank you so much, Nelson. Um, my name is Chrissy Jacob. I am the Recovery Support Services Specialist here at Faces and Voices of Recovery. I have the pleasure to work on the National Recovery Institute team where we provide technical assistance and training to RCOs and peer recovery support service providers uh, across the country. Um, I'm also a woman in long-term recovery. Um, what that means to me is since November 30th, 2014, um, I've been able to keep friends, um, be an excellent mom, my opinion, not theirs, um, <laughs> and um, just enjoy life. Um, and it's been the greatest experience um, that I could ever have hoped for. Uh, and that's a little bit about me and I'll pass it back to Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. So during our time together, we're really gonna talk about the value of lived experience and how we can leverage the value of lived experience in the work we do to create this recovery-oriented system of care, to improve outcomes and to alleviate challenges and barriers for those that we serve. Uh, this session is designed to assist behavioral health professionals in understanding how to integrate peers within systems of care and the difference between peer support and case management, as well as how to support the peer workforce. We'll also be discussing a theoretical case study. This is not a, a real individual, uh, but it does align with what kinds of challenges and barriers that we see individuals face and how those individuals can um, utilize peers and the values of lived experience to navigate those challenges in substance use disorder and mental health challenges. 
if you haven't had a chance to, then we want to know who's here with us. So please do drop in the chat your name, your pronouns, where you're from, your organization, um, your, your title, and your relationship to recovery. As I had said before, in my journey, peers were incredibly impactful in helping me to achieve recovery and what that means to me. So in treatment, individuals with lived experience met me where I was at and listened and shared their experience, let me know that I was heard and uh, inspired me with hope and all of the things that I wanted to be able to achieve, I knew it was possible within hearing from them and their experience. Uh, and that continued through my experience in recovery housing. Uh, and now I am a certified recovery support peer specialist here in the state of Texas, using my lived experience to keep that cycle going and inspiring the next generation of peer leaders uh, and helping folks to recover. So let's talk a little bit about our case study and meet Tyler. Uh, they uh, are... Oh. Sorry, Nelson. I, we don't see the slides. I'm sorry. You don't see the slides? No. All right, let me try to reshare. Okay, so, thank uh, you. Um, can you see the slides now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Terrific, thank you so much. Zoom has little hiccups every once in a while. <laughs> True. So thank you for uh, thank you for doing that. That would have been real embarrassing going through the whole presentation without any of the slides. Um, so let's meet Tyler. They are uh, 20 years old. They use heroin. They are transgender and use the pronouns they them. They are currently experiencing homelessness. They are HIV positive and unfortunately they're cut off from their family. So if we see some of these descriptors. Uh, we could possibly begin to, to form some ideas on how we might approach to treat or offer support to this person. We also might be able to start to form some ideas on what some of the possible barriers to achieving and uh, beginning the recovery journey might be. So if you would take a moment and throw into chat what are some of those barriers that Tyler might experience? What are some of those challenges that Tyler might experience in their journey to recovery? They see you shared stigma, absolutely. Uh, we understand uh, that individuals, people who use drugs, face a, a tremendous amount of stigma, let alone the additional intersectional layers of stigma this that uh, they might face. Lack of self-acceptance, yes, thank you. Isolation, Julie and Deborah, absolutely. Wow, we got a lot, a lot of folks chiming in. So implicit bias, lack of trauma-informed care, no social support, misinformation. Anthony, you said individuals not aware of how to serve individuals that identify as transgender. Okay, absolutely, right? Treatment system uh, and behavioral health systems that are set up to, uh, to serve a, a, a hetero cis normative population. All right, basic needs are not met. Barriers to healthcare, lack of social network. Thank you all for sharing those. So yeah, um, and I'm sure a lot of us have worked with individuals that may have some of these challenges that may have experienced some of these barriers and um we're all here today because we're passionate about um making a more recovery oriented system of care for these individuals so let's uh start off and consider some of these barriers or gaps in their journey consider that tyler was to be uh, assessed and waiting for a referral to treatment. With no place to stay, right? They're experiencing homelessness. Where are they gonna go while they have to wait the three to six weeks for a, for a bed? And suppose they continue to use, they live alone. Dare, dare we say they experience an overdose? That would be tragic. So let's be optimistic for a moment and say that Tyler does get through the waiting period. 
and they're able to be connected to treatment. A lot of you stated this already, most treatment environments may not provide the appropriate training or resources to be culturally responsive, to be trauma informed, be able to serve individuals that uh, are transgender. So our friend Tyler might end up being misgendered that might start a cycle of trauma. Um, they need, they're not able to be given a safe space where they feel comfortable for residency. Um, imagine, or maybe you have experienced this for yourself, feeling uncomfortable in a new place, in a new environment with new people, and on top of feeling uncomfortable in your own body. So Tyler, when uh, in clinical settings like these, um, any medications that they are on or maybe should be on might not be properly prescribed while they're staying in a treatment location. James, I see your question. Uh, why would you need to wait three to six weeks for a bed? Well, unfortunately, some, uh, some states and some regions, um, openings for state-funded or uh, free treatment beds have a waiting period. that They're not available to be immediately put into a residential uh, treatment facility. But great question. Or I don't know if you're asking more, more broadly, like why? Why, <laughs> why would anyone have to wait three to six weeks? And I share your outrage, James, to be frank. Um, and so there's things that we're trying to address here. Um, so Tyler might have to abruptly discontinue medications because maybe they are not being prescribed by the doctors that are in-house in the treatment center. There's a lot of potential situations in, in this case that uh, might be challenges or barriers to Tyler in their recovery. So uh, let's say that Tyler manages to remain in treatment past these barriers and gets to a point where they will transition out of treatment uh, to a recovery residence. So if we asked about recovery residences in your area, some of you might be able to identify a, a, a few of them in a relatively quick manner. Some of you might be representatives from recovery houses or work in recovery houses. But can you identify at least two that you can say without a doubt that our friend Tyler would feel safe, comfortable, and supported in? That they would feel like this is a place they can hope for a better future? While um, we, we would strive for that ideal, nationally, we continue to see a lack of resources for our uh, trans recovery community. And yes, some might be trans friendly, but that doesn't mean that they're responsive, protective, nurturing, and supportive. And something that usually happens in recovery residences, right? They're often uh, segregated by traditional gender norms. So there's a lot of considerations here uh, for looking at how we can support individuals like Tyler in the recovery journey. Um, more than that, right? Um, connection to a supportive community of recovery. Where do they go to get connected to somebody who has had a similar journey that has overcome some of those challenges that Tyler is currently facing? Are you familiar with uh, where the LGBTQ recovery community is and, and the kinds of activities and how to get plugged in with those in your area in, in New York? Also, difficulty finding a job and paying rent, right? Tyler's got bills to pay. Um, they got they have to be able to afford rent so that they can stay in a comfortable and safe environment. Unfortunately, most trans individuals who find themselves on the street resort to sex work to help make ends meet. There's a whole culture and mindset around that. And when you're having trouble trying to find a job because of the way that you look, the way that you present, uh, and the stigma around that, right? Uh, that might not match information on your documentation. So again, another level of stigma and barrier that they face in terms of getting a job, being able to pay bills. Do you know of at least five employers in your area that are willing and able and happy to support and hire a trans person in early recovery and also provides a safe and supportive zero tolerant 
environment for harassment. So with all of this, how does an individual like Tyler even stand a chance? Well, we're gonna come back and revisit Tyler here in a little bit. But imagine for a moment, having a relationship with a community where you have access to organizations and people that can help fill the gaps and fill gaps of service. A community that believes in the services that you provide and authentically feels like a stakeholder in your success. Having knowledge of events and activities and resources in your community, being plugged in, having relationships across the state and local environments that support a recovery-oriented system of care. Many of you may have already heard this term before, often abbreviated to ROSC. Um, imagine having vested community involvement. Well, it's been happening. It's been happening for decades inside different recovery communities. So 12-step uh, communities have been using personal connections and networks to help others, to get into treatment, to find housing, to find employment, um, connections to social services, healthcare, clinics, um, everything. They've been leveraging the value of their lived experience and how they were able to navigate a system that wasn't necessarily set up for their success and be able to pass that on and translate that to new individuals in recovery and help them. Famous uh, recovery researcher, writer, and historian, many of you are familiar with him, William White, wrote recovery support roles that emerge with very close connections to communities of recovery are prone to disconnect from those communities over time. As the persons filling those roles come to see the primary source of their power and authority coming from within themselves and from their professional organizations. So simply he states when peers uh, whose work exists primarily in the community are made to provide services in a closed siloed network, a siloed organization, the connection to the community becomes lost. Now, we hire peers because of their experiential knowledge in navigating a system of care and their relationships and connections within the community. So consider this for a moment. Peers have used the same service systems. They've been there, done that. They've gone to the same meetings. They have met with the same people. They found themselves in similar situations. They have that lived experience, that experiential knowledge that we know that we can leverage because it is of great value. And they know the community leaders and gatekeepers. So those individuals with lived experience help to create this recovery-oriented system of care by better connecting the community. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Chrissy. Thank you so much, Nelson. Um, so recovery, peer recovery support services, they are designed to help people in recovery and or their family members and significant others. Um, to, and they're designed also to initiate and or sustain recovery from alcohol and substance use disorders and related problems and consequences. And by providing social support, which is just imperative on the recovery journey that you have like-minded people that you can connect with out in the community and be normal, right? Do things, um, go to go bowling, go ice skating, do these just activities that, you know, I personally um, took for granted um, that I would have, you know, the ability to do these things and enjoy them. <laughs> I thought I had to put something on top of every activity to enjoy it in the past. And it's just so freeing to be shown a different way through the lens of the peer, um, peer support. The next slide. Um, and so uh, peer support is also, it's a, it's holistic, it's community-based services that help facilitate recovery. And a lot of research suggests that providing holistic community-based support services enhances treatment outcomes. So I know that that was true for me um, in my treatment experience. I, I, had, I was surrounded by peers and hearing somebody say that they did it 
And that person, I still remember the conversation. I, she had 10 years in recovery and, um, she did yoga <laughs> and she let us, uh, yeah. And I'm a yoga instructor really from that first interaction with a peer, because I wanted what she had so badly. And I saw the way for the first time in my life to, to get that. Um, but experience shows that ongoing community support is important to sustaining recovery. Um, and that lessons learned from the mental health consumer and the HIV and AIDS peer communities point to the value of such services, um, particularly with the HIV and AIDS. You know, it was the peers in that community that that led that march that made it a priority to our, our leadership, our state and local um, and federal legislators. You know, it was the people impacted most um, that led that charge. And 65 years of experience from 12-step groups highlight the importance of community-based services in recovery. Next slide. Uh, so there's a lot of types of, of peer support. Um, so we can provide that emotional support, you know, demonstrating um, empathy, care, concern that that is born out of having that lived experience. I've been there. I've done that. You know, I don't know, but I can understand. Um, also, the and it can look like uh, mentoring, coaching and support groups. Um, and then we have that informational support, the assistance with knowledge, information and skills, life skills training, job skills training, citizen restoration, educational assistance, and health and wellness information. You know, like I said, my first exposure, not my first exposure to yoga, but exposure to somebody who did the yoga I wanted to do <laughs> and um, had the experience of the benefits. And I could hear that firsthand. That was, that was really impactful to me. Um, also that instrumental support, you know, um, the concrete assistance and helping others get things done. When I entered in recovery, I had lost custody of my children and I needed help to get those them back. That was my only goal when I entered treatment was to get those children back. Um, and if it wasn't for the assistance of peers and showing me what to do, how to do it, and don't give up and just kept reiterating that goal to me, you know, I, I wouldn't be here. Um, so it's just so important that you have that, you know, somebody who can show you how. Um, but it can also look like, you know, just driving somebody to a support group, to a 12-step meeting. It can look like um, child care, you know, providing that for support groups so parents can pay attention <laughs> in these meetings and, and, and get that fulfillment and connection that they need to sustain their recovery. Um, and also, you know, clothing, I lost everything in, in the beginning of my, my recovery journey. I lost absolutely everything I've ever owned. And I had so many peers who were willing to give me clothing and journals and pens and pencils. I had nothing. And, and they really built me up. Um, but they also can provide, you know, writing a resume, these, these simple things that, that can be forgotten or, or have never learned before. Um, they also do that affiliating support. So the, the feeling connected to others, um, having a social group or community, establishing a positive identity. I had to learn how to grocery shop. I had to learn what I liked. And I, and I learned all that, or I was given the grace to learn who I was um, through peer support. <clears throat> um, but alcohol and drug-free socialization is so important. Um, it, it's really a skill. <laughs> I think you have to learn having fun again. Um, I know when I was providing direct services, that was one of the number one things I would hear, you know, am I ever going to have fun again? And yes, more fun than you will imagine. Um, so, um, you know, we really need to promote healthy norms and connection to non-drug using communities. And that's what peers can provide. Awesome. So what to look for in a peer recovery support provider? Um, recovery support activities clearly differentiated from professional treatment services. Um, the, the, the ability to manage that fiscal responsibility. Um, an infrastructure to collect data um, using the GIPRA, you know, just, just some uh, some tech savviness is always helpful. 
um, but the ethical framework too, including um, the plan to protect partic participants from harm. You know, a lot of our um, peer certifications, they are very heavy on, on the ethics and the values and having, you know, really concrete boundaries for self and, and for others. Um, but you want somebody with, you know, programs for recruiting, screening, training, and supervising peers. You want to be able to develop peers as well. You know, what, what do you like to do? You know, what are your passions? How can we lead you um, and, and help grow you as a peer? Um, making sure that we're compliant with local and state regulations and a risk management strategy. You know, we're not immune to um, substance use disorder, having had one already, you know, and overcoming that, but we're not immune to daily stress, compassion fatigue, secondary trauma, and these can have a big impact on our recovery as well, on our personal recovery. Um, and some settings for peer recovery support services, community-based recovery support organizations, RCOs, <laughs> uh, treatment providers, we can be every step of the way, you know, um, primary care and other physician offices. And I think, um, you know, reaching out to some of these, if, if, if you are a community provider and just letting them know like, hey, we have peers here and maybe we can connect and, and um, you know, help you help them. Because sometimes we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> Um, but hospitals, emergency rooms, and elsewhere, you know, it's really important. I, I got, we connected earlier with Keith, and I think that he was, he is supporting individuals in New York, you know, who have uh, had an overdose, and that's just so impactful, just somebody coming there and not judging and saying, I've been there, you know, I see you. That, that, that has such a, um, it's a magical effect, I think. Um, but social service agents, agencies, accountability courts, jails and prisons, you know, but, but where else, where else aren't we as peers and, and where should we be? You know, does, does anybody want to come off mute and tell me something? <laughs> Share with us, where should we be? Hi. 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 Oh. Go ahead, Zach. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as far as where peer recovery support services should be, mm -hmm. um, that's the question, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you know, one place I had no idea where it would even be relevant to have peers, mm -hmm. but apparently a place where there's a lot of overdoses are libraries. And when it comes to getting connected to resources, libraries can be instrumental and a focal point for that. So having boots on the ground, so to speak, in places like libraries where things are more readily available than they are anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. Excellent contribution. I hadn't heard that before. Thank you, Zachary. And Jay, did you want to add something? Yeah, absolutely. I'm currently a, an outreach SERPA, so I'm constantly walking the streets. And as you see right now, this is in my office. I'm at a community center because I did a food drive today. Uh, and I trained multiple people with Narcan and let them know what we had to offer. So I spent my time walking streets, uh, going into the gas stations, uh, doing my best to get these people to get trained for Narcan. I go into low-income housing uh, facilities, uh, offer our services, fentanyl testing strips. Uh, if they're interested in harm reduction and they want recovery treatment, we provide all that. Uh, so, you know, my goal is to meet somebody where they're at, and let's change your life because there's a better way to live. So that's that's what I do. I'm always out hitting the street. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you for your service. Absolutely. And Keith, did you want to, you're on mute, go ahead. Yeah. Um, one of the, you know, aside from the, the clinical stuff that I do with uh, Dash and Family Service, I'm a volunteer over at Thrive. That's a community center for recovery with multiple pathways to recovery. You know, you, you really... Uh, recovery is, um, is a hard sell for a lot of people, you know, especially the community involvement. And when you, you know, a lot of people um, are limited to the that, that 12 step, you know, 90 meetings, 90 days, get your sponsor and work the steps the rest of your life. You know, people tend to shy away from that like a vampire in sunlight, you know. So, uh, you know, one of the things I do, I host an open mic night um, for people in recovery every uh, every first Friday of the month over at Thrive. We're getting a huge turnout but like to to pitch you know fun social connection 
and uh, an expression, you know, artistic expression. Uh, a lot of us in substance use disorder have uh, poetic souls and musical souls and, you know, to, to incorporate that as part of your recovery, you know, um, it, it's, it's, it's a game changer, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Keith. That is beautiful. Yeah, we're everywhere and we're everyone, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. How beautiful. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Um, did we go over there? So some activities that peer support workers can do within an organization, they can advocate for people in recovery, you know, and what that can look like is maybe somebody has entered, you know, has to go to the emergency room. What I can do as a peer, I can be so annoying and I can call that emergency room and make sure they're warm, right? Make sure they have a blanket, make sure that they're getting fed, make sure that if they didn't bring their medications, that their medications are provided for them. You know, I can just be an extra voice um, for them, for whatever needs that they have. Um, we can share resources and, and skill building, um, right? We can build communities, we can build relationships. All of my friends and most of my family now is in recovery. Yay. <laughs> So there's a lot to talk about, um, but we can lead recovery groups. You can do, you know, we have all recovery um, and we can get creative, right? We can do arts and crafts and that can be a recovery group. We can do, um, we can make music together. We can work out together. We can go do P90X and, <laughs> and kill it in the morning. You know, we can do whatever we want and we can call it recovery, right? If it, it's, if it's fulfilling and it builds us. And we can mentor people and we can help them set goals and achieve that, you know, fulfill their, their, their potential. <clears throat> and all other things we can do, we can provide services and trainings. Um, we can supervise other peer workers from our experience. Uh, we can develop resources. We can meet needs. We can say, hey, there's a barrier here and I have an idea and I can put it into action because I have the support of my community now, right? So we can create too. Um, we can administer programs um, or agencies, and we can educate the public and policymakers simply by telling our own stories. They're empowering and impactful, right? And so we, there's a lot we can do. This is a short list. <laughs> um, but where can we be helpful too? Where can our peers be helpful? Preceding formal treatment, you know, strengthening motivational motivation for change. Um, the, like Keith is talking about meeting somebody where they're at and Jay, what Jay does, you know, being out in the community, that's a, that's a perfect place for a peer, right? <clears throat> Accompanying treatment. So having those peer um, recovery support services built into treatment programs has been really impactful in my journey. And I'm sure some of y'all's as well. Um, but following treatment, you know, supporting prevention of a recurrence of use is really impactful. Um, and there's data out there that states, you know, once um, somebody in recovery gets to that three to five year um, mark within the recovery journey, the, 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 the rate of return to use is 14 to 15%, right? So we really want to walk alongside people until they reach that position, that long-term recovery position where, where their recovery is sustainable. And, you know, apart from treatment for someone who cannot enter the formal treatment system or, or just chooses not to, you know, supporting them, doing maybe a daily check-in call, you know, hey, how are you doing? You need anything? You know, we can be that. Um, and from the clinical treatment to the recovery lens, this is kind of a paradigm shift, you know, in, the, in maybe like the 70s, 60s, 70s, it was all recovery. Recovery was what it was, you know, it was so big. And then we had this long shift towards treatment. Um, and we want to just kind of, you know, treatment is a part of recovery, right? It's not in lieu of recovery. It's not separate. It's a part of, um, and it's a larger construct. And the treatment has an endpoint, right? We're not going to be in treatment for the rest of our life, ho hopefully. <laughs> um, you know, but the, the, the goal is that long-term holistic recovery, recovery coming from within. Um, recovery support services are grounded in a strength-based approach and that focuses on wellness and a full re-engagement with the community. You know, I'm, I'm way more invested in my community than I've ever been in my entire life because of my recovery. And recovery support services build on capabil um, capacities that already exist within communities, right? So we're already 
meeting some of these needs. We're enhancing these programs just with our lived experience. And so um, peers really keep people connected to the community. You know, we're out in the community, we get our recovery with a recovery community. So when somebody is new and they're just coming in, who better than a peer who's already utilizing the services, already going to meetings to introduce them to this way of life. <laughs> um, so peers are aware of what is happening in the community. They know all the events, the activities, the meetings, which meetings are appropriate. You know, maybe there's one that, you know, I don't know, maybe there's your favorite one. All right, we'll go positive, we'll go strength based. Maybe there's your favorite one. You want other people, you want, yes, come to this meeting. It's amazing. All we do is laugh. <laughs> we know the selling points too, right? Um, but connection to potential sponsors and mentors, you know, already having a good grasp on, you know, what where our friends in recovery, what their strengths are and how they can support other individuals. Um, physicians that are recovery friendly, uh, that's been very important in my past. Um, and churches and institutions of worship. I never thought I would go to church and now I go Wednesday and Sunday. I'm one of those and it's a recovery church and I just, I, I want to tell everyone about it. I'm sorry, the music's really good. Um, but opportunities to be of service and, and to give back, you know, that's so fulfilling in my recovery journey. Um, job opportunities, I, the job I have now, I would never have without my local RCO, somebody tapping me on my shoulder and said, hey, you should do that. You should, you should try that. <laughs> um, but recovery friendly employers and workplaces and how to help with living arrangements. You know, we, we just, we learn, you know, we're so capable, you know, and, and we want to pass that knowledge on. That's what, in my experience, that's what peers want to do. We want to give back. Um, so we also want to talk about, you know, the supervision of peer workers because peer workers fill relatively new and unique roles in the behavioral health care system. And supervisors may not understand peer support very well um, to provide like a high quality supervision. And the organization might not be aligned with recovery oriented values. Um, so leaders in the peer run recovery community organizations may not have experience with supervision and may not have organizational structures that support the activity of supervision. Um, providing supervision promotes good ethical practices and supervisors play a key role in the successful integration of peer workers in the workplace. You know, we want to make sure that our, our organizations are recovery friendly, um, that there's room, you know, when we're working with peers, it is easy to, um, gosh, just, just take it home with you. You know, it's, it stays in the heart sometimes and we need that space to heal after, after those interactions as well. So we can continue the work. Um, so some challenges for, for non-peer supervisors. Supervisors may lack experience in working knowledge of the of peer practices, what we can do, what we know, our knowledge, and, and how impactful and empowering we can be. Um, supervisors may have a, a clinical approach to service provision, um, or we I think we just take a more therapeutic approach as peers. Um, super, they might lack the knowledge among non-peer staff about peer, peer roles and practice. Um, and what we learn through our certifications, you know, they might not know that we know motivational interviewing, you know, we can, um, we know about ambivalence, you know, we understand it. And we can work to, you know, spark that motivation for change. And organizations may not be aligned with recovery oriented values, practices, and just the culture. Um, and challenges in integrating peer workers and recovery values in a treatment setting, you know, this, this is what we've seen can be challenging. Um, more challenges <laughs> for peer supervisors. That's okay. <laughs> um, they may like may lack training and experience with supervision as a peer. Um, may, they may not lack the knowledge among non-peer staff about peer roles and practice. Right. So it goes both ways. Um, and the organizations might not be aligned. Is this the same? Might be the same information I just read. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'll, just, I'll just go with it. <laughs> and um, peer run recovery community organizations may not have a culture of accountability. You know, um, so it's important to have those structures in place in any organization, so that 
grievances, challenges can be met head on. We can lean into those. We don't have to know today and we're not going to know today what we know a year from now, but it's important to reflect and grow on that knowledge and, and create better systems. All right, so there's a lot of benefits to the supervision of peer workers, and they include, um, you know, providing opportunities to reflect on peer support practice, you know, making improvements, making adjustments where needed, um, delivers better outcomes through learning um, that comes from exploring and discussing work issues. It enhances our problem solving skills and improves clarity and objectivity in decision making. And supervision empowers, motivates, and increases worker satisfaction. You know, having that, um, I have supervision with, with my director every week, and it's just wonderful to see how I've grown in those situations and to get that feedback and reflection, because I can't always see myself clearly. Um, but it's a beautiful, and it's, it's a trusting relationship where I get to give feedback too. So it's, it's very empowering. And benefits to the organization for supervision of peer workers, you know, supervision is a tool that can be used to achieve the agency's mission and objectives. And it's important to reflect back on to our why constantly, you know, why am I here? Why am I doing this work? It can be challenging. And, and the why of the organization too, going back to the mission, the vision, the values of the organization and make sure that that is, is clear in everything I do and say, and on behalf of the organization. Um, supervision improves performance and helps to manage resources. And the supervisor serves as a mediator and a liaison between the agency and the worker. And good supervision can increase morale and improve retention, which I know in this day and age is one of our, our, our biggest challenges, you know, keeping people, you know, are we supporting them? Do they feel heard, seen, believed, you know, are the challenges that they're experiencing, you know, are they, are they addressed? You know, so this is all very important. And we want to always be strength based, always leading with a, you know, positive and encouraging. So focusing on strengths does not mean ignoring problems in any way, but rather means that the supervision frames problems just as opportunities to learn, to grow, to enrich this experience, right? And feedback and self-assessment tools in strength based supervision are, are very impactful. There's a lot of things that you can do online. Um, I know something we do on our team is we learn, you know, we took personality tests and we we're like, okay, I'm going to get along great with you. We might have some challenges. So it's, it's, it was an excellent way to get in front of those. Right. And to learn how somebody works and reacts and, and, and how can I, I how I can contribute to the health of the team as well. So I'm going to pass this back over to Nelson. <laughs> Thank you, Chrissy. So hopefully over the past uh, few slides, you're starting to formulate some ideas about how peers can be utilized and how they really help to benefit and create a recovery oriented system of care. They are an excellent referral source. They, they are actively engaged in the community. So peers are often asked on how to get help for family members, friends or other members in the community. I know I get I still get those calls from individuals that I know from meetings that I knew from uh, living in a recovery house two years ago. I'll get a call and say, "Hey, you know, I got somebody that I, I need. I need to get some some help." And you know, peers are familiar with how the process works, who to contact. You know, okay, so you need you need to show up to Homeward Bound. You need to get it. You need to get there at six a.m. because they start processing. You know, uh, they do their intakes first come first serve. You're going to talk to Janet, like. You know, we're, we've been there. Um, we also know what other uh, funding opportunities are available within your local community to support peer services. Um, <clears throat> different organizations, uh, workplaces, uh, foundations that might be interested in funding peer work if we are able to clearly articulate the value of lived experience and how we can integrate that. Um, and they're able to connect people directly with the resource. Um, I'm not just going to text you the phone number of somebody. I'm going to conference call you in and introduce you. I'm going to drive you there. Whatever, uh, you know, we want a low threshold, low barrier to entry um, so that it is as easy as possible for individuals to, to get plugged in. 
And if I was to sum it up in um, just a couple of words here, peers are the connective tissue. They uh, help to create this thriving recovery oriented system of care. Um, this is not a very well illustrated graphic, but it is an effective graphic. And so if you're looking at um, our community as a web, organizations and businesses um, are those individual points where the webs intersect. Our peers are those lines in between. They're connecting. They're taking us out of that silo and they're uh, uh, creating this environment um, where in the individual pieces in our community can thrive and work together. And the fly is that person receiving services. So wherever they land, whoever they contact, whatever organization has that initial intake, there is no wrong door for that individual. No more days uh, of people with substance use disorder going to a mental health clinic and being turned away because we don't treat that here or vice versa. So, so through a robust and connected system of care, we would be able to break those silos, to stop the siloization um, through better partnerships, memorandums of understanding, agreement, contracts, building rapport within the community. All of this helps to create stronger relationships within the community. Leveraging our peers, those individuals with lived experience, and treating the members of the community at, as subject matter experts in their own needs, their own resources, helps to generate that investment and that, that buy-in within your organization, within your committees, within different activities and events that you might have be having going on. Um, people are more invested in the things that they help to create. So involve them, involve your peers in, in all aspects that you possibly can. And it helps us all to become good stewards of our resources. So it's no longer um, all about my program or my services. Uh, it's about what's best for the individual. So ideally within a recovery-oriented system of care, individuals have a comprehensive menu of services and supports available to them. And they can access or be connected to or be driven to uh, or be plugged into any of those wherever they find themselves within this service system. And that is to just simply become recovery oriented. So now I want, we want to hear from you. In one word, describe a system that is recovery oriented. You can unmute or drop these in the chat, but I mean, what does that mean to you? Thank you, Carrie, supportive. It's a great one. Stigma free. Thank you. No wrong door. Empathetic. Person centered. Person centered. Boom. What else we got? Trauma informed. Okay. Self determined. Self determined. All inclusive. All inclusive. You all get an A, A plus, great work. So looking at the, the recovery values and a lot of those values that you that you just described, if the, um, they're just simply good tenants of, uh, it's tem tenants of being a good person. And if we think about how we want our service system to provide services, well, we want them to do uh, provide services in that way. We want uh, us to be trustworthy and honest. Um, we want to operate with integrity. We want to be open-minded and non-judgmental, empathetic, like you, a lot of you had mentioned, compassionate, supportive, inclusive, uh, collaborative. That is that uh, principle of being um, self self-determination and per and person-centered. Right. We want those services to be collaborative, not just here's what you need to do, right? Um, but let's explore what your goals are. And we'll see what available supports and resources that we can match you with to support those goals. What do you want for yourself? 
helps to build that uh, self-determination and that autonomy. So let's get peers in action. Let's get them going. Let's let's get our peers coordinating events. Um, let's get them involved in team meetings and staff meetings. Let's get them chairing committees. Let's get them out there on advisory boards. Let's get them facilitating focus groups and uh, listening sessions and town halls and really leverage that lived experience um, to to generate that community involvement and that community buy-in that will help to create that recovery-oriented system of care. So um, something that we look at from an accreditation standpoint, remember I work on our accreditation program, the Council on Accreditation of Peer Recovery Support Service Services, is in being intentional about how you do everything. And that starts with how we recruit people with lived experience. So we can provide training and training of facilitators for recovery-oriented system of care 101 to peers and those that supervise peers and help to manage peers. Um, have peers identify leaders and gatekeepers within the community. Facilitate that ROSC 101, bringing in the different siloed agencies and behavioral health organizations from across our community um, and, and have that be led by a peer who can provide that explanation, the benefit of lived experience and how we can create that uh, recovery oriented system of care in our community. And really treating community members as the expert on what they're seeing in their community and treat them as a valuable resource. Or just ask them, ask peers, ask peers what's going on. You know, uh, what do we need to do? Where are you seeing the challenges? Where are our strengths? Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure if I was to ask uh, James or Keith, I'm sure they would be able to talk my ear off about what's going on in the community because they're living it. And we need to capture that. That's part of this paradigm shift that Chrissy mentioned is instead of viewing substance use disorder as a, an acute event that requires a brief intervention and treatment, right? looking at it as a chronic health condition that uh, requires maintenance and management, that requires long-term support and care. And how do we do that? In a realistic, low-cost, low-threshold, low-barrier-to-entry way? Let's ask the folks who've been doing it for decades. Let's ask our peers. Let's ask our folks with lived experience. And it's important to, to always consider um, how are people with lived experience going to be impacted by decisions, by programs, by services, um, and that we're including them, and engaging them, and not just giving them a seat at the table, but actively listening and incorporating their experiences and their advice and suggestions in the decisions that we make. So the work we do in the recovery movement is not done without the voice of lived experience at the table. If there's a particular challenge that you're discussing solutions to that affects a specific group of people, if that specific group of people is not at the table when you're having that discussion around how do we solve this challenge, then, I mean, we're doing, we're doing it wrong. Uh, we, we, there should be nothing done for people in recovery without people in recovery being part of the conversation and better yet, leading the conversation. This has to do with everything around what does and doesn't happen in the community. Decisions about access, funding, services, resources, advocacy, legislation, um, and, and this is, you know, even local ordinances around housing, employment, education. We need people with lived experience to be part of those conversations. And we, the best way to get a sense of what they know works and what needs improvement, where are the potholes or the gaps in the system is to engage them in participatory processes. So these are those shared decision-making processes um, that are employed to achieve active participation by all members of a group in a decision-making process. It operates in a strengths-based way 
these processes can be used to evaluate the effectiveness of supports and services. So a lot of peer programs that we work with nationally have peer advisory councils or peer advisory boards that help to provide input. These are folks who currently receive services, have formerly received services, family members of folks who have received services, uh, community stakeholders who actively and regularly engage in referring to those services, folks with lived experience, and they're able to participate in the idea generation and decision-making process. The primary goal of participatory processes is to create a productive dialogue. And yes, the secondary goal is to develop positive solutions and come to consensus. But really having that productive dialogue is the primary goal. The specific method you want to utilize really depends on what the participants want to achieve. So um, always dive into what is our goal before we dive into how do we get there. takes a village. Recovery may be initiated in a facility or a treatment center. That happens for some of us. It happened to be a part of my journey, but we know it's sustained and grown and blossoms within the community. So much so that folks become contributing productive members of that community. They need to be involved in any recovery oriented system of care efforts. So now we're going to jump back to our friend Tyler. Remember, they struggle with uh, heroin use, they're transgender, they have been experiencing homelessness, they're HIV positive, and they have been cut off from their family. So we're gonna do a quick breakout. And what I wanna do for a moment is, if you have the ability to bring your phone up to your screen, take a screenshot, take a picture, so that you have this to take into your breakout group. And uh, Carrie, as the host, we'll just ask you to create some breakout groups and, and let's put four folks in a room and let's let them be in there for uh, five to six minutes. And what, we're, what the goal is here is we wanna get some ideas of where some of those gaps in services um, could be filled, right? How can we, better assist an individual like Tyler in these different gaps in their journey. And if possible, let's utilize uh, some resources and supports that you're aware of in your community. And then we'll be coming back and we'll be breaking out. So hopefully you've all had a chance to take a picture or a screenshot of this. I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes. Um, if you have a piece of paper or a notepad in front of you, Let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, so write down what you how you know how you would help Tyler, what resources are available to help, how we could make Tyler's journey seamless. And here in about a minute or two, we'll start open it up for some conversation, okay? All right, so let's open it up. If you would like to share a little bit about how you would help, what resources are available to help an individual like Tyler, then please do unmute, raise your hand. Um, and if you uh, don't want to talk, then you're welcome to just drop your contributions in the chat. I know we have a number of peers on the call um, and some more experienced peers too. So it'd be great to hear about some of the resources that you would utilize and how to approach such a complex case with such high needs. Patricia. Yes, go ahead, Patricia. Hi, everybody. I am at um, Rensselaer, well, actually Troy, New York. Um, and um, if somebody came along that was in need, such as Tyler, um, I would have the ability to provide an assessment and find out what basic needs they need 
and how I could provide them locally will be to connect with some of the resource providers around here. There's a program called Unite Us. And they can go online and connect with that if that's something that someone is uh, capable of doing or your program is connected with them. Um, down the street from a hospital setting. So if um, they needed to go to the hospital, somebody here, a peer advocate, could actually walk them down there. If they were not in that level of crisis, uh, somebody could also walk them or drive them to um, the homeless shelter nearby and um, at least provide them with a place uh, to sleep. Um, uh, the homeless shelter, to my knowledge, does not have any, um, you know, uh, what's the word? They, they don't even allow you to come in there if you're using. So they don't have any restrictions. Um, once they're in the homeless shelter, they could get connected with somebody that can bring them down to the local Department of Social Services. And they can stay in touch with us throughout this entire process, by the way. I work for an agency called, um, I'm the Troy Living Room. And I'm through uh, RSS, which is Residential Supportive Services, but we're in partnership with MAHEP, which is a mental health empowerment program uh, or empowerment exchange up here in um, Troy, New York. So um, there's a lot of different services that need to be initiated. Sorry. Okay. Um, and uh, again, we can do that with them. So that would be awesome. And then... Um, you know, I'm just thinking of, I kind of listed a couple of resources already to support them in their journey, but we also have the um, the willingness and the wanting to go out into the community as an organization and um, uh, check on that person and see if they wanted to come here and hang out here in, in our living room and, uh, you know, listen to them. And we have some peer support specialists right in the building that we're uh, partnering with. And, um, also, there's a lot of meetings around here. There's literally a meeting uh, facility across the street. And so I know on Friday nights, there's a young persons group. You mentioned that they are 20 years old. Um, and so they have recovery meetings there. And then there's a capital district recovery center also um, that they can connect with um, if possible. And uh, they have another service. One final service is that we have a program called Bridging the Gap, which is a um, uh, program if they were to get into a treatment center they could like connect with somebody before they were discharged from um the hospital you know if that experience was able to happen and then just have somebody basically walking with them um yeah that's what i wanted to share <laughs> patricia thank you I, we heard a lot of really great resources there we also heard the principles of person-centered uh, we heard uh, assertive connections and outreach. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much. We had some contributions in the chat before I go back uh, to more folks who have unmuted. Keith said this Thrive Community Center has an excellent LGBTQ plus in recovery group. It promotes alternative pathways to universal recovery. Thank you, Keith. Anthony said uh, that they would provide them with information on the center located at, there's the address which provides services for LGBTQ individuals that has a host of resources from employment to housing and of course, substance use disorder and mental health treatment. If interested after, um, assist them to get referral process and even go with them to initial orientation. That's fantastic. And Keith dropped in the website to thrive. All right, who else would like to unmute and share a little bit about how they would be able to support Tyler? Hi everybody. Well, first of all, I'm going to ask Tyler what exactly he wants out of his recovery. I mean, everybody's recovery is different. Does he want MAT? Does he want to go inpatient? If he wants to go inpatient, I'm going to facilitate that. Uh, depending on what kind of insurance he's going to, what he has, depends on where I can place him. Uh, and typically, you know, within 24 hours. If he wants MAT, I could have a script ready in about a half hour. No worries. Uh, as far as housing, uh, he'll come up with DSS housing for right now. And if they come out of treatment, one in the treatment, whatever that last looks like, if they need clothing, I write a referral to Treasures in Saratoga, get them some clothes, uh, set them up with somebody to come deliver food for them uh, from an outreach service from SOS uh, to take care of whatever their essential needs are at that moment. Uh, coming out of treatment, I could either place them in a halfway house a three-quarter house, whatever that looks like, if there's like a, a SPOA thing, a mental health thing on top of whatever his other issues or 
with the drugs or whatever the case is, I would take a look at that, see where his needs are going to be best fulfilled uh, with that. Um, then on top of, you know, coaching Ray Long through the whole process, act as, you know, like a motivator, a cheerleader, inspire the people to create change. That's like what I do. And that's what, <laughs> and there's all kinds of LTGB uh, Q meetings around. Uh, I, I would reach out to friends of mine that are in the community and be like, oh, this person needs ideas where to go. Because I couldn't tell you right offhand where they are, but I know my connections, they'll tell you right offhand. And there's multiple meetings all around, Troy, Albany, Saratoga. Uh, as far as job goes, Saratoga hires everybody. Um, our community is pretty open to uh, different people's lifestyles. So, you know, fortunately, like – Saratoga would be a great spot. Come on down. Well, uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, it sounds like you would be able to help Tyler and uh, helping them really navigate the service system there. So thank you all so much for attending today. As I mentioned at the beginning, this survey is so important because not only does it um, help with funding, but really what it helps with is your feedback. This whole free series was developed from your feedback, from feedback from community-based organizations, from peers, from people working in the field, and most importantly, as the organizations um, that weren't utilizing peers and were just learning about peers and the questions that they had about how to onboard, how to integrate, what would that look like in some of the organizations that you guys had mentioned in a community center, um, at a school, in probation, in parole, and what changes might we see in our community if peers were everywhere? Um, if there was a lot of street outreach, if there was a lot of outreach at faith organizations and et cetera, and all the places that you mentioned um, are just so key. So thank you all for your dedication to this work, for your curiosity about the work. Um, and Kate, please uh, unmute and introduce yourself because we are so grateful because without Orrin, we would not be able to have these presentations and offer them for free with these wonderful subject matter experts. So again, thank you so much, Faces and Voices of Recovery. Incredibly grateful to you and for the work that you do. Kate? <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, I'm here from Orrin. Um, and everyone can please scan this code and give us your feedback so we'll be able to give more events like this. Um, and Nelson gave out the information before, but I can put it again in the chat once I'm not screen sharing anymore about how to reach us and my email. And if anyone has any questions about what the Opioid Response Network is or what we can do for you, it's completely free. And we get to help put on great events like this. So just reach out and we're here. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. And again, for the continuing education credits, the only thing you had to do was remain on for the duration of the presentation and fill out the survey. And then those will be sent to you. Um, usually everything arrives by next Thursday. And on Thursday is my go day to send out the recordings, additional materials and resources. I review the recordings. So sometimes some of the questions that come up or some of the things that Facing and Voices have shared for either the presenters or for myself, we're like, oh, you know what? There's another great resource um, for, the, for, for the attendees. And we add those in as well. So be on the lookout for emails for myself. Um, and the, the um, CECs, Kate, what is the at that it comes from? Because it doesn't come from SAMHSA, it's Columbia.sp, what is it? Sorry, just so that it's people the, don't it's the same it. um, the It's email, the same email route as me. So it will be nispy.columbia.edu. Okay, so um, if you don't receive it, please check your spam and look for it at nispy.columbia.edu. Yeah, and, and then we can always help you. tie up any loose ends that come with that if someone doesn't get their certificate that they need. And each one of these presentations builds off um, the one before. So our next presentation on September 8th, I hope you'll be able to join us, um, is on health equity and um, the role that peers play in developing health equity and developing a culturally sensitive 
um, environment and reviewing best practices for culture change and what equity centered work really looks like. Um, and that could be applied everywhere. So I encourage you all to come back and also to invite your colleagues and other folks in the community that you feel would benefit from it. And we thank you so much for your attendance.